many millennia. Are you fascinated by the unknown? Drawn to the mysteries that lie beyond the veil of our everyday world? Join us at the Mysteries of the LBL Conference, where the boundaries of reality and legend begin to blur. This year marks the first of what promises to be an annual deep dive into the enigmatic land between the lakes, or LBL, a place shrouded in tales of cryptids, ancient Nephilim, and spiritual warfare. Legends of the LBL speak of creatures lurking in the shadows, mysterious disappearances, and battles between good and evil forces that echo through time. Joined renowned experts such as Dr. Douglas Hamp, Vicki Joy Anderson, and others in an intimate setting as they explore the legends, share their research, and engage in thought-provoking discussion. As a special highlight, take a guided trip to what the locals call the Vampire Hotel, a site known for its eerie past and connections to a notorious vampire cult. Experience firsthand the chilling history that adds to the whole mystique of the LBL. Don't miss out on the unique opportunity to journey into the heart of mystery. Register now for the first ever Mysteries of the LBL Conference. Visit CampPermont.com for more details and to secure your spot. The truth awaits. Are you ready to discover it? Hey campers, we are live with another episode of Camp Hermon. Well, we're not technically live, but I'm sitting here with Mike Stibbs and Joe Sheehan from the Christian Underground. Mike, I love having Joe on. I like Joe. I like I like Joe because he sees the big picture with the politics. He knows that it's, you know, he knows that the Clintons, Bidens and Obamas are basically like a mafia. That's what, and then I and I know he sees that. I know he understands that. I know he he spent some time um, you know, on Capitol Hill living in the area, probably seeing that corruption, you know, and uh you know decides he wants to live a normal life and have a family and now he's you know on the other side of it he's a christian now what do i do with all of this information let's you know talk about that through a christian perspective i think it's important that's why i like joe 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 is american he may not be a six pack joe i don't know maybe he is maybe he's a closet <laughs> drinker bag of chips. i'm not sure but you know <laughs> joe how are you I'm doing good, man. Ah, that was a great, that was a great intro. Great intro. Yeah. Uh, reminds me of, I went to a, a improv group here in Fort Worth and, uh, here in Texas. And they, uh, they gave me my own theme song. It was simple kind of man by, uh, nice. by Leonard Skinner. And so, uh, that used to be my ringtone for a long time. So yeah, uh, definitely, definitely trying to, Live out a simple life, um, one that God can, that brings honor to God and God can be pleased with and raising my girls and just doing that. But it, God definitely allowed me to see a lot of things and to learn a lot of things. And man, it's, it's amazing. It really is. Joe, it's amazing to see what's going on. What is going on? Like, what the heck is going on? Well, I, I think what, what we're seeing now is uh, something that you see often in, um, believe it or not, in the collapses of societies. Um, if you look at history, if you look at what's going on, um, what's really interesting, and I was having a conversation about this with my dad um, the other day, but what we can tie a lot of what's going on in 2024 to what happened in 2020 in that. Um, and uh, we can talk about the, the pandemic. We can talk about all that, but what what we have to do is we have to dig a little deeper, dig down into the roots a little bit. And one of the things that we see is that we were programmed during 2020 
Uh, those of us who were deprogrammed as a result of what was going on in 2020 see what's happening. But what happened is they used the pandemic to program the American people to basically accept anything and everything that's going on. Um, the gaslighting was so consistent for 12 months to a year that now if anyone has the audacity to point out, um, you know, let's, you know, and we'll, and we'll get, we'll get a little bit more deep, deep into it, but any, any, if anyone points out anything, um, the American people now accuse you of being a conspiracy theorist, a tenfold hat person. Um, they won't even deal with you. They won't even talk with you. Um, and, and so what I, what I find very interesting is over the last four years, uh, from 2020 to today, um, we are seeing what I would call the bread and circuses moment of the American experiment. So one question that I think maybe someone who's listening to you for the first time, maybe they haven't listened to some of our old episodes is who the heck is Joe Sheehan and why should I care about what he has to say? Give us like just a 30 second snippet of your your experience your education and why we should listen to you on any of this well i would tell i would tell anybody i mean my opinion in three dollars and fifty cents will buy you a cup of coffee at starbucks um but you know but that being said um i have to give a real quick bona fides uh Bachelor's degree in political science, master's degree in counterterrorism, uh, was studying a PhD in public policy from Liberty University, uh, worked 10 years uh, in and out of professional politics, including a stint on Capitol Hill as a speech writer um, and legislative correspondent. I taught, uh, you, I taught history and government in uh, high school and also uh, AP government, uh, where I was teaching at the collegiate level um, for high school students, helping them pass AP exams. Uh, and then, um, so that's that's kind of, in a nutshell, that's who I am. But I would say, honestly, I'm, I'm no one. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot smarter than me that are out there making, uh, making really great points. But what I, what I tend, where I feel like, and, I, and it goes with what Mike says, is I'm, I'm one of these people that kind of, I don't, I don't have a, uh, a dog in the hunt. Um, I'm willing to sacrifice the sacred cows. Um, I really don't care. It's it's about the truth and it's about uh, God's truth going forward. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate your humility, Joe, but I mean, I think your, your education and your experience do give you a pretty strong voice when it comes to discussing politics and just kind of things that are going on just because you've kind of you've peeked behind the curtain um mm -hmm. and you've got the years of experience um you know with your your degrees you mentioned conspiracy theory and mm -hmm. what i think is interesting joe is if you look at the definitions of conspiracy and the de definition of theory separately and i'm going to read them so here's the mm -hmm. definition of conspiracy, a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. So here's mm -hmm. the example it gives. She served five years in prison for taking part in a conspiracy to sell stolen artworks. So that's what mm -hmm. a conspiracy is, right? Conspiracy to commit murder is a crime. So and then when we look at the definition of what a theory is, it's a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. Then when we look at the definition of a conspiracy theory, a belief that some secret but influential organization is responsible for an event or phenomenon. It's like this definition of conspiracy theory, they make it seem like it's so outlandish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think when I look at those two together, I'm like, those seem reasonable, right? Everyone kind of gets that. But then when we put them together, people just lose their minds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it goes back to the Warren Commission. Um, after JFK was assassinated, the CIA uh, put forth the, the modern definition of a conspiracy theory. 
Um, as someone who studied briefly the law, I will tell you that um, that conspiracy theory is basically any kind of prosecutorial um, charge, any kind of indictment. An indictment is in and of itself a conspiracy theory, especially in our system of government, where uh, our system of government operates under the assumption that every person is innocent until proven guilty. Um, so therefore, every every charge, every indictment, every time a person it goes to court, there is a, cons especially if it's a group, okay, um, that is being charged with a crime, conspiracy is going to be the theory of the prosecution's case. Um, I think what happened is um, as people began to get closer and closer to the truth, the CIA needed to discredit. And what we have seen since uh, really roughly the 1940s on is a, an incestuous relationship uh, between the government, corporations, intelligence agencies, and the media. Um, there's a reason why they call the media the fourth branch of government, and it's because the media is equally as, as important in governing as uh, as the, uh, the in any of the other three branches. Uh, in fact, the media will have probably the greatest sway. Uh, Mao Zedong understood this when he was um, helping Ho Chi Minh basically put together a, a theory in which um, they fought the Vietnam War. And they knew that the only way that they were going to defeat the Americans in the Vietnam, Vietnamese War is if they defeated the Americans at home. And the way that they did that was they went after our media. Um, if you look at all of the statistics of the Vietnam War, we won it. We won every major battle. We won every we we uh, the the casualties of the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese um, and the Arvin soldiers were not even close to the U.S. I mean, it was almost four or five. Even there are other top ten to twenty to one um, U.S. versus. Uh, um, Viet Cong to U.S. Um, we won it in every measurable, even 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 uh, Tet 68. We won it. Um, but if you look at the U.S. news reporting from 1968, January 1968, from the Tet Offensive, you would almost think we lost it. You would you would you would have thought we lost the war, and you can actually trace back um, in the Vietnam War. You can trace back to that news reporting all the way until uh, Nixon brought home our boys. So, yeah. Hey, Joe, I'd like to show so. you this um, this image, uh, and we'll go we'll go through this image, and maybe you can help uh, some people make sense because you know you're talking about you know the whole picture, like you know it's 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 mm -hmm. deeper, and this is um. This is uh, Tyler's uh, cycle of civilizations. This is kind of an old, mm. if I remember correctly, this is kind of an old theory um, that was maybe mm. brought forth in the in the <clears throat> 18th century. But let me bring this up real quick, and this will just put it into uh, into perspective for a lot of people here. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, multiple participants can share simultaneously. Um, I just want to show. Okay, that's cool. So, can I show it? Um, why am I getting that like that? Yeah, just bear with me, real quick. Of course, good, man. of course, we will make sure this is all okay. Now, what what are we gonna see here? You're gonna see my. Um, add a sticky note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, what? Uh, okay. Um, hey guys, move on while I figure this out. Um, okay. Well, yeah, and and I've got something to add to that when you find it. Um, but yeah, um, let's. You know what? If you want, um, let's talk a little bit about 
um, kind of what's going on. Uh, we can do presidential election. We can do Trump assassination. We can do, because I, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about DNC, about what happened in the DNC. Yeah, I'm conv I'm, I want to know how, how, why did it happen so quick? Trump gets his ear shot off. Biden steps Biden down. down. Kamala Harris rises to the top. What the, what the? <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, so let's, those are, those are a lot of layers to that onion. Um, but again, I think um, when you have an organization of people that are no longer worried about the American people, about the American people or about the voters, when you have an organization and, uh, and, and, and I call it a cabal, I call it the government industrial complex. I don't even call it the military industrial complex because I think it involves more than just the military. Um, I think when you look at when you look at that and when they're no longer afraid of the people, they're going to do whatever they want. I think what happened is. If we go back to the debate performance by Joe Biden, OK. I think they they allowed Joe Biden to go out there because they needed to be able they had spent three and a half years convincing the American people that Joe Biden was OK. So they needed an event to be able to go, nope, Joe's not good. Joe's not good. Joe, Joe's struggling. Joe's having cognitive issues. Um, and I think they needed to make a deal with the Bidens that um, allowed Joe to leave on his own quote unquote terms, even though I don't, I'm not even convinced that Joe is cognizant of what's going on right now. Um, I think Jill and Hunter have pretty much done this and and we have precedent for this happening before in american history um woodrow wilson's wife basically ran the country for a month uh after woodrow had uh, a stroke and uh so so we have kind of this idea so i think the dnc um you started seeing people um kind of rebel against the dnc the dnc needed to be able to consolidate um, whatever influence and power that they had. Um, so deals were made, deals were struck. Now, I will tell you that um, I think these deals were made and these deals were struck in 2020. Um, matter of fact, I told my dad back in 2020, I told him that uh, there's no way that Joe finishes the election. Kamala becomes the president in the United States, or at least becomes the candidate, so that they can have their historical um, candidacy of, you know, a woman, um, in the White House and in in the different things like that, so I think that's that's where you see. I think there there are so J Joe has a bad performance. He shows that he is not there, right? Um, which many of us have been saying for years. He isn't there, right? Um, I think so. You have that. Then a couple of weeks later, you have Trump. If Trump doesn't turn his head at the right moment, we are we are in a constitutional crisis in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. Because now we have a presidential candidate who is no longer with us. Uh, I think Trump definitely, if he doesn't turn his head at the last minute, is executed. Now, I know that there are some people that are out there, uh, God bless them, that talk about, you know, it was an inside job that, that Trump tried to do it. I'm going to tell you right now. I I'm going to put I'm going to I'm going to put a big big grain of salt on that one because that it was um, that you, it was an inside job that it was an inside job and and the reason why is this if it's an ins I would I would be more of a believer that it was an inside job if he had been shot in the chest and he was wearing uh, Kevlar but the fact that um, it whizzed by his ear. Um, Nick Desir, um, all that. I don't know. Um, you don't really go for a headshot, and I don't think Trump is a uh, suicidal plot. Now, there are enough conspiracies behind that that we can get into, and we can deal with that on another thing. But I want to kind of keep it cogent and moving in a different direction. Just so you know, I got my I got my stuff together. So when we want to transition, okay. and but but yeah, you're right. If that was if that was a Trump inside job to try to make him look cool, that's pretty mm -hmm. brave. That's like you said, it's pretty brazen. You wouldn't do a headshot; you would do a body shot. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And and there were people who were killed behind him. So um I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm not gonna go there. Um however there are enough conspiracies surrounding everything else that that could be a show unto itself. Uh highly recommend looking into Senator Grassley's investigation into it. Uh the questions that he asked, um definitely, you know, look into that. Um, but moving into so moving into DNC, right? So you've got Trump goes into the RNC uh, two days later after being shot. Um, and there were some moves in the RNC that were very, very suspect. For the last 20 to 30 years, the number one voting block for the Republican National Committee has been evangelical voters to the tune of 33 to 37%. Uh, you do not win the presidency in a legitimate election without evangelical voters. Correct. The two hot button, button issues for evangelical voters are abortion and gay marriage. And what are the two things that the RNC pushed through before there was ever a vote, didn't allow a vote, didn't allow anything? That they were going to scale down their rhetoric in regards to outlawing abortion, and that they were going to scale down their rhetoric regarding uh, gay marriage. That was done deliberately going into the convention to try to alienate conservative Christian voters, and they did a very good job. I'm going to mind you, because there were a lot of conservative Christian voters, especially in the Twitterverse and in social media, are talking about they're never going to vote Republican, they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, because why? The Republican Party tried to say that it was Trump who influenced it. Hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm saying that for a reason, because I'm going to come back to it later. Okay? And don't let me forget this. So Trump goes into the election. The next thing you have is you have a porn star give a speech you know, who's who's an open Satanist. You know, you have um, you have a U.S. senator give a speech in front of the Illuminati symbol. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on that it's like we're trying to poke the bear. Why? And, and so you have to ask yourself, why is the Republican Party trying to poke a bear? Why are they trying to get the conspiracy theorists to get these people out there? Right. You have to ask yourself that. Okay. Then going into the DNC, for the first time in American history, well, I wouldn't say modern American history, since the passing of the 17th Amendment, you have an American presidential candidate who hasn't received one vote. by the American people in a primary hasn't received one vote and they are being named the presidential candidate of that party who claims to be saving democracy, that Kamala, they're protecting democracy. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Exactly. Kamala Harris is, is, you know, she didn't receive one vote. Okay, they didn't vote for vice president. They voted for president. Joe Biden got those votes. Right. Okay. Um, they and it and it just and, and of course she got like little to no bounce out of the convention, which is like not good for any convention person. But here's here's what's really interesting though. Out of all of this, if you look, if you look at the data, if you look at the things that's coming out, is they've all but given her the presidency. The media's all but given her the presidency. They've all but given her the presidency. And we're and I'm just going, the data doesn't show that. The polling data doesn't show that. Trump is Trump is, I mean, leading an and and so it almost it's almost as if something that we're seeing right now is are they leading us back to 2020? Is this gonna be another? Is this gonna be another steal? Like and... I just I, I wonder, Joe, like what what what's their play? 
because even mm. even back in 2020 like if you would have asked me honestly like i would never have thought in a million years that joe biden would ever be president right mm -hmm. and not based on whether it's democrat or republican it's just i he the dude is 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 oatmeal you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh you know it, now it seems like they've doubled down on this um these bad decisions kamala harris is uh she is not an articulate uplifting human that is going to be able to change or save anything in my opinion mm -hmm. and so it's like i wonder what their play is because it happened so quick and they could have been they could have they could have had another play they could have had gavin newsom in there somewhere they could have done uh us they could have done so many different people that had way more cred street cred than if she they, did so so what's your i will tell you right now that? if oh sorry sorry to speak over you um i will tell you right now whole hop if they were genuinely serious about winning the election genuinely serious right they would have named rfk jr rfk jr pulled better than trump in many of the states but don't so they having don't RFK, they don't they hate him though they i mean even his sister came out and and with the rest of the family and endorsed joe biden i mean gosh yeah. what, how how much what's what what betrayal well think about it think what if if we if we sit back and we and we look at big picture we take 30,000 foot view here what do trump and rfk junior have in common uh that, that they Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You no, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I was probably I was probably going to answer wrong, but I was going to say that they have they have an agenda to fix the uh, corruption. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and they can't be bought. Right. Amen. Okay. See, there there are some people, and and I've and I've talked on um their podcast before that they believe that Trump is part of the the same globalist cabal and all this kind of stuff. Sure. And and I'm just going to tell you, as someone who who who's paid attention to this and has been in those and been in those meetings and seen and seen the people who want to have influence and know how they think, I will tell you, I I think Trump was such an anomaly in 2016. Um, I mean, the fix was in with Hillary, and I think they realized that. I think 2016, they they you know they allowed a vote to actually happen. Trump comes in, takes the election away from Hillary. Um, the that that would have been, I mean, it would have been a nightmare as a presidency. But but Trump comes in, and then what does Trump do? Trump can't be controlled. Okay, because here's the thing: you can't blackmail him, which is what we've been talking about the last couple of times I've been on. You can't blackmail him. Why? Because one, he'll pay it, and two, he'll announce it. Right. Trump doesn't care. Okay, this is a man. I mean, he didn't deny his relationship with Stormy Daniels. He didn't deny his relationship with Catherine McDougal. He didn't deny uh, his relationship. So, so Trump doesn't care. All right. But at the same time, he's embarrassing China on the international sphere. I mean. There's a saying in sales my dad taught me because my dad was in sales for 40 something years. He says a sale, a good salesman is someone who can smell, sell ice to an Eskimo. Right. Trump sold rice to China. I want you to think about that. One of the last deals that he signed with China was China was going to buy majority of their rice from us. That's awesome. That's not a that's not a guy that's sitting there trying to bring about the one world global government. That is literally a man who's following. I I I did not vote for Trump in 2016. I actually ran a, a write-in candidacy in Virginia for myself because I wasn't going to vote for Hillary and I wasn't going to vote for Trump. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I got three votes. It was awesome. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> one was myself, one was my wife, and one was my dad's. 
<laughs> oh, dude, your I, mom threw you under the bus, man. Dude, she <laughs> that was my mom. I have an Irish mom. What do you really expect? I mean, you know, when we got when we got disciplined, it was with a wooden spoon or a or a rolling pin. So <laughs> uh you don't mess with an Irish mother. But but yeah, I mean it's it's one of those things where you know you look at Trump and you go, the reason why I voted for him in 2020 was because for the first time in my life as as a uh, from you know my first election was voting for w in the first uh election in 2000 you know um i i got used to candidates not fulfilling their promises right and trump fulfilled almost every single one of his promises right in his presidency the only thing he didn't fulfill was draining the swamp and i think that was i think that was trump 2.0 i think that's what was going to happen in his second term when when he didn't have to worry about re-election and I think that's one of the reasons why if you look at the, if you, I mean, and I've, I've said this multiple times, I believe in 2020, we had the government industrial complex come together, both Republicans and Democrats came together and collude, colluded behind Trump's back in order to steal the election. And here's the reason why I believe that the the Republicans were willing to do it for for 17 years that I've worked in or been involved in professional politics, the number one thing I've always heard in the back rooms when nobody talks about it, you know, publicly, Republicans are always talking about we do better when we're in the minority. We don't like being in the majority. We don't know how to use power. And it's true. We don't. We don't know how to use power. When we're put in power, we don't know how to use it. Well, the reason why we don't know how to use it is because we have too many of the, the guys that are influenced and being influenced by the government industrial complex, where it's real simple. If you want to cut the budget and you want to and you want to bring about there are there are simple things that you can do to do it. And and we can go into that another time, but Republicans never these Republicans can never get enough votes to do it. Why? Government industrial complex doesn't want it. The oligarchy doesn't want it. Okay. And Trump scared the oligarchy. Mm -hmm. He was coming after their money. Yeah. And um, anybody who's ever paid any attention to Glenn Beck um, prior to the 2020 election, Glenn Beck did an amazing series on the Ukraine and how the Democratic National Committee was using the Ukraine as a slush fund with organizations like Burisma and different things like that. Um, matter of fact, John Kerry's son and uh, and uh, Hunter Biden were, uh, received multi-million dollar uh, contracts from Burisma, having never been in that industry before. Um, and so when you look at, when you look, I mean, that's why we're, that's why Ukraine even, why we're even concerned about Ukraine, right? Why we're even worried about Ukraine is because that's the slush fund, right? What was the first thing that Trump got impeached on was ask, having the, the temerity to ask Zelensky to investigate one of their guys, right? Because he believed that this guy was laundering money for the DNC, was laundering money, was not being legitimate. And he asked Liz, Zelensky to ask his attorney general to investigate this banker. Who wasn't being legitimate, right? Who wasn't where a large amount of American tax dollars were going to, to this banker, right? And what happened? All of a sudden, now he gets accused of denying weaponry to Zelensky and he's being impeached, right? So, so when we look at Trump and we look at when we look at the Republican Party, I think that that's one of the reasons why the Republican Party changed the rules, changed the platform before Trump got there. Because Trump's riding this wave, man. He's he's coming in. He's 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 survived an assassination attempt. I mean, there's nothing he he's got a honeymoon period that like no tomorrow. So we got to do something to screw the pooch. Yeah. So right? it looks it looks like it looks like uh you know it 
so to speak, it looks like, you know, God's on his side on this one. But then, and you had mentioned, and maybe we can explain this so just everybody can understand, is you said they're kind of planning another 2020. So if the plan is not to win the election for the Democrats, then that means they have a nefarious plan that's coming after Trump gets elected again. Am I it, right? That- and well, and, and I think, OK, let's 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 play. Let's play two two possibilities. OK, Trump gets reelected. They're going to impeach him. They're going to he's they're going to use lawfare. They keep accusing him of. Remember, anytime the Democrats accuse you of something, they're doing it. OK, yes, correct. Plain and simple. And, and it's been that way since forever. Anytime the Democrats are doing anything. Or accuse you of doing anything they're doing it and so they're going to use lawfare they're going to keep him involved they're going to keep him you know going to you know to get that impeachment i think you know and, and then to get him removed from office to just finally put the death nail in his coffin and send him away into obscurity and then well who do you have left well you have jd you have jd vance and as much as as much as JD Vance is a Marine, as much as he's you know whatever, he, he he's definitely someone that you got to keep your eye on, because I mean, if Trump, I don't know why Trump chose JD Vance. I there it doesn't make any sense to me, because the true reformer that could run wonderful guns in twenty twenty eight and win the election, and continue this reform on down the road is is uh vivek ramaswamy and yeah he's a hindu but he's gonna you know he's got some good he's got some good guns you know when it comes to to those types of things so what i think what i think so let's say trump wins that's what happens with trump wins i think the democrats maybe who knows what they're going to try to do in that regard i think the other side and this is what i think is more plausible is that Kamala, that they will do anything and everything short of killing Trump to ensure that uh, Kamala wins in 2020. Because if Kamala wins in 2020, now you've got a four, you've got a, you've got a presidential candidate with the potential for, for eight years. Okay. And there's a lot that can be, done and one of the things that we learned in the obama administration is that that you don't necessarily have to be an active president to be president of the united states all you got to do is get czars and and the people that the people that obama put into place during his presidency are the same people that are in place right now the same people that have been rubber stamping and and doing all the things for joe Okay, and and I'm telling you, it's it's a scary situation we're in because there's also. If the steal happens, do you really think that I know that there are people out there right now and and I and I pray that cooler heads prevail. But I know there are people out there right now that if another steal happened, I don't think that they could contain themselves. And I think I think. um that you're going to see some small scale violence. Um, I think that's I what they were. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, I'd like you to speculate Joe on how they would, how you think they could possibly make this uh, another steal happen because we had, you know, the ballot harvesting with all of the mail-in ballots um, previously uh, and maybe some of the dominion machines, you know, hacking into those or whatever the case may be there. Um, how would they do it again? And then, so that's that's a question I'd like you to speculate on. And then, well, don't you I'll think go there's going to be, this is a two-part question, don't mm-hmm. you think there's going to be violence either way? Because I feel like that mm-hmm. if, pre- if, if, if Trump does win the presidency, that the left and, you know, whoever's being funded, Probably George Soros money. I don't know, you know, whoever else may be funding, you know, Antifa and these different people to to go around and, and riot. Don't you think that would happen as well? Mm. Either way. I do. Oh, okay. So let's let me let me go to the first question real quick. Um 
we're still using Dominion for our voting machines. So that's still an avenue. Uh, you've got monkey pox right now. <laughs> uh, trust me, I hear about it from my daughters all the time because, you know, uh, they don't want to miss school. <laughs> they don't want to go into another COVID situation. Um, I think so. I think there's there's still a lot that can happen. I mean, we're we're 60 plus days out. Right. There's still a lot that can happen. Um, there could be um, there could be a lot of different things. Um, you you no one really addressed. Because because see, in 2022, we had we had elections that were stolen. OK, um, we had we had elections that were stolen in 2022 based off of the Dominion. And then no one, no one did anything, not even in Texas. We didn't even, we didn't even pass laws here in Texas to address uh, voter fraud. Okay. So there's still a lot of avenues for voter fraud that can still take place. And again, you're not going to get accurate reporting on it because the media is not going to report it. If anything, they're going to gaslight people, right? The same way that the Republicans gaslit their fellow Republicans when they were talking about that the election was stolen. It's they're using the same exact talking points as the Democrats in 2020 all right it it could it could still happen the going to the second going to the second question the violence will be met with two separate um responses if trump is elected the violence is going to be met very similarly the way violence was prior to 2020 okay it's still going to be these antifa um antifa riots um it's going to be you know and, and, and it's going to tear up democratic cities but it's not going to tear up republic it's not going to tend to tear up republican cities or i mean they tried to do the same thing here in uh dallas and people went no all right um people attacked uh the rioters and came out and defended buildings and things like that and you had kyle uh, rittenhouse in in wisconsin and in places like that so i i think you have a very similar response the tragic response is going to be if Kamala wins and there's small scale violence. And I and, and this goes back to one of the things that I heard um one of the talking heads, uh, I think his last name is Probziak. I can't ever say his last name right. Probziak, Probziak, former naval intelligence officer. And one of the things that he was saying is that was probably one of the reasons why they tried to kill Trump. Okay is because think about what would have happened. And this is what he was saying uh, to, to Tucker Carlson. He was saying, think about what, what would happen if, um, if Trump had actually been assassinated. All right. The Boogaloo people would have gone berserk. Um, and there would have been, there would have been attack on government buildings. There would have been attack on government institutions. Um, I don't, I don't see innocent civilians being attacked. But I do see, I mean, they went after they went after guys that were led into the the Capitol building on January 6th, like they were domestic terrorists, denying them of their due process rights under the NDAA. Right. I mean, it's it's if you think that they're not, and here's another reason why I'm saying that. Prior to Trump being shot, two weeks prior to Trump being shot at Fort Bragg. Now, who's at Fort Bragg? Anybody? Y'all know? Okay, 82nd Airborne. Okay, 82nd Airborne, Special Forces, um, Special Forces Group, Delta's there. Basically, who we send out if there are large-scale riots. And at a safety briefing to these personnel, they went... The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense outlined what a domestic terrorist looked like. Guess what? Mike, Chris, myself, we'd all be domestic terrorists. <laughs> Wolverines! Wolverines! <laughs> yeah. We're, we're BB! All right, anyways. Um, so, love that movie, by the way. The original. The new one's good, but the original's the best. Yeah. Patrick Swayze. Um, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, but the uh proud Texan, by the way. Anyways, uh, but yeah, so think about it. If these guys actually kick off Boogaloo and go after it and start going after and, and actually 
you know, doing their thing. If you think they went after the guys on January 6th, the way they went after, imagine what they would do to those guys. Yeah. And then utilize, and then using that to go after anybody else. And, and, and so it was, I think, I think what we, what we witnessed honestly um, was a coup attempt with Trump because it was an attempt to try to get the people, they keep trying to push the buttons to get the people to act in such a way that they can implement martial law, that they can implement and control things. And that's where they want to go. That's where they ultimately want to go is, is because, and, and I think that that's, I think that's the scenario. That's, that's the game plan, Mike, to answer it. And I I know it's 20 minutes to answer it. So the game plan is to, get everybody so pissed off that they mm-hmm. they respond in a way where they can um well they well they can use the justice system and yeah and, and, well and i mean put, think uh, about put it them away um well, think about marx's think about what what marx and gramsci and derrida and marcus right. and all those guys think about what they said that communism cannot happen without a revolution right Yes. And okay. you, and you can't if, if if yeah. And so if it can't happen without a revolution, there has to be an anti revolution that's mm. you know that's gonna try to, to make it go away. Yeah, the um, synthesis and the antithesis. What it, now now I ask myself these questions, right? Okay. So so I I, I want to show this, I want to show this chart because it's so simple and I think people can understand it. Most people have probably seen it, I hope. But I want to I, I want to ask the question, dude, is is the government seriously demonic? OK, mm. OK, like seriously, like not not just like, well, you know, people are people are people and they're just going to be evil. But no, like is is it freaking demonic? OK, now mm. let's look at this chart. Let's look at this chart. And is it tied to the Nephilim? Um, now watch this. Yes. And let's let's take Nephilim this. Hunters. So yeah, this is the um. Are are y'all are y'all able to see this on here? Yes. Yeah. And can you, for those who are just going to be listening and not watching, can you describe what we're looking at, Mike? Um. Yes. I don't know why it just went. Uh. Maybe if I do this, I will describe. Yeah. I'll just basically, basically, what this is is it's it's sort of like a flow chart. Okay. Um, and it's mm-hmm. it's called this is what they call the Tyler's cycle of nations. If I if I am correct, it was kind of came about in the 18th century. But mm-hmm. each if you look at it here and the and the the theory is that each before a great nation comes to be, OK, they start off in bondage. Right. And you could even parallel this back all the way to Egypt with the Hebrews how they're in bondage in Egypt as they're making, you know, they're, they're basically making bricks. Okay. So they're in bondage. And then from that bondage begins to arouse spiritual faith because you're in a situation and you need faith, you know, and then that faith begins to turn into courage. And then that courage will start to act and you will start to become free. So in that great courage right there, you will see a fight back. You'll see a war that gets that gets that nation free. Then now, now we are free. We have our liberty. We can do what we want to do. And now we start producing as a nation. And all of a sudden we get abundance, right? And this goes with, uh, with uh, Rome here too you get great great abundance and you're doing very very well but selfishness starts to come in right we've been seeing Mm -hmm. that in this in our era for a long time um Mm -hmm. once selfishness comes in then comes apathy because now what you have is you have literally almost two generations that didn't have to lift a finger to get the freedom that they are enjoying and whining over every single day 
oh my gosh, my burger's not cooked to perfection. Screw you, eat the burger. We're not getting another one. Thank God that you can eat that burger. You know what I'm saying? The mm -hmm. things that we complain about. Oh, my Wi-Fi has been down for five minutes. I'm so anxious. Shut up. You know, it's coming back on, right? But they have no clue who fought and how many people died and how many people uh, strived for you to be in the position you could be in right now so you could be at your house fat and happy watching TV. Dependence. Now we become dependent on that nation right? Welfare, right? Mm -hmm. Welfare mm -hmm. and all of this uh, stuff, it all goes back. It, it goes back into bondage because now we're dependent on the system so we can live. And it mm -hmm. starts all over again. So my question Mike, is to you, Joe. That... Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead, Chris. Just going to say that reminds me of that saying that I've been hearing a lot in the last few years. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times or no, exactly. hard time. Yeah. yeah hard times create strong men. Same. Yep. There we go. Mm -hmm. It's that same yep. cycle. It's exactly it, It's exactly that same cycle. It is. It really truly mm -hmm. is. And so, so here we are. We are, um, I think we're in kind of a conglomerate of different stages here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going back to bondage, but that's the point. Now, it's my question, two full question where are we? And, mm. and in, in this thing right here, and is the push, the political push that we're seeing towards Marxism, um, at at the at the one great extent to you know socialism, mm -hmm. which would be the 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 lesser of what they would try to call it, mm -hmm. um, is that the push we're trying to see um, in mm -hmm. into into bondage? Just all you, Joe. Well, that's I mean, that is absolutely uh, the historical cycle of all great civilizations. Um, I mean, it really is. Uh, I mean. You can you can put it in Rome. You can put it in France. You can put it in China. You can put it in Russia. You can, I mean, that is every great civilization that's existed. This is where we're going. I would say to answer the first question, I would say that um, we are well lost the chart, but that's okay. Um, I would say that we are definitely between uh, apathy and dependence. And one of the things that I would caution people is I don't think, thank you. Thank you for putting that back up. Um, I would caution people. What we are moving into is not going to look like the Soviet Union. It's not going to look like, um, um, it's not going to look like China. It's not going to look like Cuba. It's not going to look like Venezuela. Um, because I think what we're seeing here is um, a new kind of move uh, towards dependence and bondage. Where the Bolsheviks in Russia, uh, Mao Zedong in China, um, the Castros in Cuba, where they went after the... Um, the corporations, they went after the rich, they went after the money makers, they went after those people. Um, what we are seeing here in the United States is even something a little more nefarious, I would argue. We are seeing um, what um, Vivek Ramaswamy calls and what other people have called woke capitalism. OK, this is where that government industrial complex, that cabal comes into where or the oligarchy, um, because here's why. The founding fathers were incredibly wise in how they set up our government, and, and there's no doubt in my mind they weren't they were led by the Holy Spirit when they did it. Because the Constitution, if it's followed, protects us against communism. But what it doesn't protect us against is corporations. 
And what we're seeing right now is a dependence on corporations. Americans no longer make their own food, by and large. Uh, they no longer have a direct connection to what is put on their table. Uh, this is something unique um, in, in, in history, all right? At, at some point in history, humanity has always had a connection to what was being put on their table. Either they killed the chicken that they ate that night, um, they grew the vegetables in a garden, Um so what what we are seeing what we are seeing here is this complete consumerism that came about through apathy what you were talking about mike you know this this idea that if my wi-fi goes down for three minutes i i'll lose my mind right the addiction to the social media the addiction to the, the cell phone the addiction to um television the, the consumerism that we're seeing um, we're having to encourage kids to go outside and play for the first time in a generation. Um, you, you, me, Chris, Chris, I, I, I'm, I think you're part, you're, you're a millennial, right? Uh, Mike, you're, are you X, Gen X? Okay. But we still grew up in a period of time where, you know, kids were not seen or not to be seen or our kids were to be seen, not heard. Right. Uh, go play outside, drink from the water hose, go make forts out in the wilderness, go, you know, go skin your knees up and don't come back until the streetlights are on. That's what we were raising. We don't have that now. We have we have raised an entire generation of young people that are consumers and are raised to be consumers. They 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 are not raised to be producers. They're not raised to be innovators. They're not raised to be anything but consumers and who are they consuming well they are consuming the social media they are consuming the streaming they are consuming those things and we're benefiting from that don't get me wrong i mean if it, one of the greatest things that we could do is work is talk ourselves out of a job right you know to 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 tell people to go to the tavern and have these conversations that we're having right here on youtube but i would say that we are we are we are in that category between dependence and bondage the bondage is not going to look like government. It's going to look like corporations bonding. Because think about it. Think about what you can and can't say on social media. Think about what you can and can't talk about. Think about, and, and we have no recourse because the constitution only applies to government, right? Okay, the reason why we want to, the reason why we had all these hearings about um, social media and in First Amendment rights and things like this. Well, the thing you have to understand is your First Amendment rights stop the minute you log on to Facebook. Okay, because of the laws that were passed by the federal government, labeling them, um, giving them special protections instead of calling them a publisher, where they now no longer have those protections, and you now they can violate your civil rights by not publishing. Right. Um, they instead are given a special dispensation to where now they can, they can do all those things. They can, so, they can limit speech. So, so what I hear you kind of saying here is like, uh, so going, going forward this time, the variable that is much, is much different than it was before is dependence. You know, it, it would look like socialism is starting to take over. Right. Like mm -hmm. like like a France situation to where there's, you know, lots of welfare, not a lot of people are working because they can get just as much as if, you know, if anything, they make a little bit more if they're, you know, working, but it doesn't make sense. But now this time when we're going into bondage, we're going we're literally going into into a form of virtual bondage that mm -hmm. that's multifaceted. Because it's training us and telling us how to think. It's mm -hmm. training us and telling us what to buy. It's training and telling us kind of like what to wear and how to identify yourself as a, you know, as a human. Like I'm going to identify myself as, you know, LGBTQ plus or I'm going to identify myself as a patriot, like all of these, like, you know, niches, these big mm -hmm. niches that, you know, um, 
we we get to choose from now which is yes yeah. which is just stupid you know what i mean it's like so um so we in in this type of bondage we are not given i see we're not given the opportunity to find ourself our true right. self and i would well, say and i would say this and I'll, I'll wrap this up i i would say right here this is where i would preach is I would say within <laughs> within this algorithm right here, Jesus, Jesus mm-hmm. becomes the great equalizer because mm-hmm. if if you can if you can realize the bondage, then mm-hmm. you then he Jesus has that opportunity to show you who you really are and what this Absolutely. life is really about because life isn't about buying. It's not about who mm-hmm. you are. It's not. I don't care mm-hmm. what shirt you wear, what your hair looks like, what rapper you identify with, what social influencer you identify yourself with, because you, when you live your life that way, it's not you. You're trying to be somebody else that is over. That somebody else is already somebody else. So it's almost mm-hmm. like it's almost like we have this pandemic, if you will, of affect. Of we have mm-hmm. an, an an entire young uh, and not so young uh, wave of people that are trying to be somebody else that they're being influenced by. Well, yeah, they 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 are a generation raised in a virtual world, and where if they don't like their avatar, they can change it. Right, and, and they, they do. can be what they want. And the bondage, and it goes to what you were saying, like, is the government demonic? I would, I would, I would, I would go here. Yes and no. Okay. Yes. In that the, the system, the system that is in place right now is a reflection of the heart of the American people. Okay. James Madison wrote, in federalist 33 i think it's 33 it might be 37 that the government would be like a mirror a reflection of the people this is why john adams said in his speech to the massachusetts militia that our system of government is wholly inappropriate to any other kind of people than a religious and moral people okay this is why Gramsci, Marcuse, and his ill, the, the, the cultural uh, Marxists, went after the church. Because if you go after the church, if you infiltrate the church, you weaken the pillars that prevent the Marxist revolution from happening. What, what I look at when I look at America right now, is as long as they have their bread and their circuses, and what I mean by that, as long as they're fed, as long as you keep putting food on the shelves that they can buy, and as long as you're providing them with entertainment, they really don't care, okay? The period of apathy was definitely the period of the late 1990s and early 2000s. when only 5% of the American people were actually informed. Correct. But you know what they did, but you know what they did though, Joe, right? So as mm. long, as long as you've got, as long as you got your food, as long as you've mm-hmm. got your entertainment, they're pretty much set. But, mm-hmm. but, but once in a while, like, uh, within the algorithm, an anomaly would occur, like a Neo would occur. So what would they do? What would they do? Oh, they give them Prozac. Now Mm -hmm. they're happy again, just eating and being entertained. Now, fast forward the 20 years, screw Prozac, dude. Just go to your, go to your dispensary and buy some, some dope chronic that's been, you know, modified And you're going to be happy, man. Like, just, I'm going to, you, uh, dude, I got my burrito. I've got my TV. 
my kid has got some problems and crying over in the corner, but you know what? I'll let someone else take care of that. That's cool because I got my zone going and I'll, and tomorrow, yeah. whatever happens tomorrow, we'll work on that. So, uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, there was a question that was once asked to me by a professor, um, which was, I thought was a very strong question because he said, what do you think we are? Are we 1984 or are we brave new world? And I thought, because Aldous Huxley and George Orwell were writing around the same time, right? Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World. George Orwell wrote 1984. Okay. I think in order to get to 1984, you have to have Brave New World. Okay. I absolutely, you mentioned, you mentioned um, weed, psilocybin, um, I mean, we're getting drugs are being offered to us. Xanax is being offered to us. I mean, we're, we're overly prescribed, overly Xanax. Uh, why are we so, why are we so anxious and uptight all the time? Well, it's because we're told that we got to go, 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 go. And nobody gives us a chance to go and get out into the wilderness and get some vitamin D and go walk among the animals and do all those types of things. Yeah, be who you so are. I think, but and be who you yeah, are not but i'll just tell a... you there's one drug there's one drug that everybody's addicted to and nobody will do anything about it food oh yeah <laughs> that's true i'm addicted to mine this is a dopamine distributor yeah you the, the brain the dopamine hit you get from this is the same as a, as a hit from heroin and we're all addicted to it but see, here's the thing. That's one of the reasons why people said you can take food away from people and they probably won't riot. You take away the internet. Oh yeah. And now you're going to have some problems. So dude, dude, I, I had a, I had a friend, a, a close friend that took the the phone away from his 14 year old, 14 year old goes into the, goes into the dad's room, grabs a gun, says, give me my phone back or I'm going to shoot you in the leg. What oh my th- god so what do you think happened do you think he got his phone back or do you think his yeah. leg got shot i think he got his phone back his leg Unless got he sh- wanted his, to... his leg got his shot leg got yeah, shot? Oh, yeah okay. it's a it's a whole oh wow. my god. crazy crazy thing but that's how serious these kids are and i'm i mean myself included i mean it it the is crazy greatest decision i made with my daughters was one i don't allow them to have a phone until they're a certain age but two they don't get on like I I have control of what they can and can't get on. And the only reason why they have a phone is largely one. So I know where they are. That's their tracking device. Yeah. So I know if they're at school or whatever, but also two so that they can get a hold of me in case it's an emergency. That's it. But I will tell you one of the things that I did and, and the Lord put me onto this and, 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 and I'm kind of feeling in my spirit. I want to, I want to go in a different direction for a second because we were, we were talking about the spiritual nature of the government and, and one of the greatest things that God ever did to me. And I think it led to my personal revival was he told me to fast my phone for 40 days. And I fasted social media for 40 days. Okay. And this is, this is back when, I mean, I was still a, I was still a practicing political idolater. I hadn't repented of my political idolatry yet. Um, I was still involved in politics. I was doing all these things. And, and, and the funny thing was, is at the very moment that this happened, I was becoming internet famous. I had five, I, I, I had grown my TikTok channel from, um, I, from 100 followers to 5,000 followers in less than a month. And it was still growing. Um, I was I was Japanese famous, and that's not really being famous, but I was Japanese famous on Twitter because <laughs> the Japanese love crazy people, and and I guess they saw me as a crazy person that they could get behind. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then it was funny. It was like I, I was seeing all this great, all the metrics were going up, 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 up. It was it was amazing, and then all of a sudden, God said, "Nope, I need you to to fast." At the end of that forty days, at the end of that forty day fast began 
my journey to the direction that I'm I'm going I'm going now. And and what was funny is I didn't even see how much social media influenced me until I was done. And I got back on. I got back on my, you know, I got back on my Facebook account, got back on my Twitter account, got back on my TikTok account, and I could immediately see the lies. And immediately seeing the rage uh posts that they were sending me to get me to 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 get on and and tweet and argue and fight and all that kind of stuff. And I just went, you know what? I'm good. I don't want that. But I'll be honest with you. It took me about two more summers to really break myself of it. But I'm really proud of that. But one of the things that I want to look at when I look at moving in a different direction, and I know that there were like two questions that someone on Facebook answered, and I'll be happy to answer those here in a second. But let's talk about, so Romans 13 tells us that Every person in power is placed there by God. Okay. And and I believe that because I also I also know what John Calvin said that if God wants to judge a people, that he puts evil people in power. If he wants to bring people to their knees, he puts evil people in power. You were looking at this Tyler cycle of civilizations, and I and I see it. And one of the things that I see is you look and you read the Bible, and if you go through the Bible, you see that we are all in bondage to sin. And that it is through our relationship with Christ that that bondage is broken. And then when that bondage is broken, we have boldness to go forth and to spread his gospel which is the ultimate spiritual warfare. Um, you, all of us are Michael Heiser fans. Uh, man spoke life into us, uh, helped us see things that we hadn't seen before. But one of the things that he said was that the greatest form of spiritual warfare is the gospel. Going and taking dominion, bringing, bringing people under the headship of God is the greatest form of spiritual warfare that we can fight. Because if you want to bring about the second coming of Christ, Go spread the gospel because that's that's the whole reason why the demonic is doing what it's doing is to prevent the gospel from being spread. And 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 and, 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 and we can talk. We've been talking about the Republicans. We've been talking about the Democrats. We've been talking about these things. And I told you, I have no sacred cow. OK, I, 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 I am a independent politically. I don't side with the Republicans or the Democrats either way. The Republicans lost me in 2020 by the way they treated Trump. And the fact that some people that we know are guilty have yet to wear an orange jumpsuit. So until that day happens. But what I would say is this. Ephesians 6 tells us that our war is not against flesh and blood. Our war is against the principalities and the powers of the air. I had a really great friend of mine tell me one time that if it bleeds, it's not my enemy. It might be my opposition but it's not my enemy. My enemy is who I go to war with. My opposition is who I oppose and maybe have some conversations with over, you know, you know, but we're, we're going to, we're going to fight it out in a war of words, not fisticuffs. But the enemy that I would go to fisticuffs with is not of this world. And that's something we have to remember because the number one way that the enemy seeks to take control in our society is by sowing dissension among brothers and sisters. We saw that. That's why 2020 and beyond has been nothing but a spiritual battle in our country for the minds and the souls of the American people. Families were literally split in half because people had a different political opinion that should have been, that was a door for the church to come in and not fight a political battle, but fight a spiritual battle. And said, so your enemy doesn't have skin in this realm. Your enemy does not bleed. If it bleeds, it's not your enemy. That is not your enemy. That's your opposition. And we deal with those people differently than we do an enemy. An enemy we give no quarter to. Opposition, we listen to. We share the gospel to. We witness to. We love. 
first Corinthians 13, one through eight is the love chapter. And, and it's read at almost every wedding, it, whether they be Christian or not, it's, it's almost to the point that it's a cliche. But one of the things that it says is that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and love ultimately wins. Well, the question that I would have to anybody, sorry about that, guys, that's my dog. But the, Weasley, stop. The question that I would have for anyone out there right now who is a believing Christian, who is involved in politics right now, I want to ask you this. When you think of Nancy Pelosi, do you believe all things, hope all things, and bear all things for her? When you're praying for her, do you believe all things, hope all things? If not, repent. Repent. Because your enemy is not of this world. Now, she may be controlled by the enemy. and I, Trust me, I, I'm, but pray for that she's delivered. Because here's this is what brought me to my knees four years ago. Weeping was when I read that scripture and God said the same thing to me. These people that you're arguing with on Facebook, these people that you're arguing with on Twitter, that you're keyboard worrying and throwing keyboard grenades and, and sending shots down downrange. And just feeling all wonderful and getting that catharsis and that dopamine hit and all that. Let me ask you this. Do you love that person? Because Jesus told us, love your enemies. Jesus told us to love those who persecute you. So when was the last time that you believed that that person who was persecuting you was going to come to know the fullness of Christ? When was the last time that you hoped that your relationship with that person would be renewed and that it would be as a brother and a sister in Christ. And when was the last time you bore the accusations and the hatred with love, gentleness, kindness, and humility? Because if we want to win this war, this political war, this demonic war that is in our country, Christians are going to have to stop hating Democrats hating Republicans, demonizing Democrats, demonizing Republicans, and go after the demons that are in control. Go after the ideology. All right, I got to find the, 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 the ideology that uh, clearly comes from Satan. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and the, the thing is, is that the ones that are the ones that are sold out to it, I mean, you could sit down and show them a, a, a presentation of exactly how the ideology itself comes from Satan and they'll they'll just reject it, you know. But yeah, you're yeah. right. You're you're right. I mean, we gotta we do have to have love, uh, gentleness in our hearts, especially especially when it's brother to brother out there on the street, because I see I see so many or too many people that will talk up a game, but then when they get in an actual conversation they'll 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 you know their 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 tail goes between their legs you know and then i myself i'm a little bit more i'm a little bit more kind of like low-key politically but when i hear if i get pulled into a political conversation like i'm a pit bull and i know i need to i know i need to 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 bring that in a little mm. bit you know because it's like when I hear when I hear something that's a lie, I just want that mm -hmm. lie to get squashed. But you know, is that well, the is that the point, or is the point for them to see Christ? I don't know. So right. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. And 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 I'm just as guilty as the next guy of that too. Okay. God continues to deal with me in that um, because I do believe that God has called me as an ambassador to this world. I do believe that that I'm his image bearer into the political arena. I believe that. Uh, and and God has given me unique opportunities like this podcast, which I'm so thankful that my brothers, uh, I, I love you guys so much because y'all have been, y'all have just been a huge support in this and, and y'all deserve all good things. Um, but I'm the same way. But one of the things that I learned, and sometimes I get, I get people angry at me when I do this, but I just ask questions. 
um, especially when I hear a lie and, and I know it's a lie. Yeah. Because I know myself, I'm, I want to jump on it and rah, 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 but, but there was a, there was a political, there's a political talk show host. His name is Dennis Prager. I don't know if y'all have listened to Dennis Prager or not, but one of the things that Dennis Prager said in it, and it had a huge impact on me was he prefers clarity over being right. And I thought about that. And the thing is, I would rather know why the person believes what they believe than to ever be right in that argument. Right. You know, the same way that I would hope that they would understand, because here's the thing. One of the things that we don't realize is we really are planting seeds, even in political conversations, even when we expose the lies, when we expose the truth. What you're doing in this show is planting seeds, right? It's planting seeds that maybe we won't harvest, but someone will. All right. And I, and, and, and I, have, I have seen in my own life time and time again, people that I have have loved as brothers who didn't know the Lord and disagreed with me on everything politically or disagreed with me on everything religious, right? But agreed with me 100% politically. Come to know the Lord. And one of the things that, that and I've been told is it's largely based been based on how I how they saw me treat people. My dad came to know the Lord. My dad was an was an atheist my entire life, lapsed Catholic. Um, I mean, Boston Irish Catholic, la, you know, lapsed Catholic, had a crisis of faith his entire life, uh, entire adult life, and at the age of seventy four was working as a security guard at Liberty University. Say what you will about Liberty University. Okay. There's a lot of people out there that are listening to this podcast that'd be like, oh, Liberty's evil, horrible, blah, blah, blah. Say what you will. There are genuine people of faith. Michael Heiser was a professor there. There are genuine people of faith that are there, that are going to school there. And this is how I know. My dad spent two years as a security guard at Liberty, watching people live out their faith in front of him. And it was watching those people live out their faith in front of him on a daily basis that ultimately led him to the Lord. I love that. So don't, don't think that anybody's unreachable. There's nobody that's unreachable. I don't, I, I, I'm not a Calvinist. If there are Calvinists that are listening, God bless you. I love you. You are my brother in Christ, but I'm not a Calvinist. And I don't believe that there are anybody out there that God cannot save and will not save and does not desire to save. And my dad is, I mean, my mom, before she passed away, got to see my dad, a Christian. And here's what's really cool is a man walked up to my mom at her church when my mom and he were were married and they were not they were only married about 7 years and he told my mom before my dad died he would come to the lord hmm. my mom got to see that before she passed away that's awesome and my dad and, and, and what's really amazing is for the last 2 years my dad and I have had a relationship that I've I've only dreamt of and, and that was a prayer of mine from the time I became a believer to now. So what I'm saying is don't let something as important but as so minuscule as politics to come between you and someone is ultimately the gospel. And, and, and this is why I say this, and I'm going to tie it all back in. And then I'd like to get to those questions. <laughs> I'm sorry if y'all want to. Um, is I'm tying this all into this. It goes back to that James Madison and goes back to that Tyler's circle. If we are going to see, and, I, and this is becoming so cliche, but it is so right. If we want to see this nation turn, we've got to get passionate about the gospel. Because as the people turn to Christ, the nation will turn. Because that constitution is a beautiful thing. And I don't think it's too late. I really don't think it's too late. And I think we're seeing it in the young people of this nation. 
because just just this last week or yeah just this last week there was a revival led by the ohio state football team on campus the ohio state football team on campus so there's a lot to be positive about we just gotta we gotta focus on it and we gotta and we gotta pray against the things that we're seeing and but understand this though if all, all these horrible things happen don't let the utilitarianism of the enlightenment get in our way and and we're trying to fight against suffering understand that christ's church flourishes in persecution we shouldn't hope for it but don't get me wrong i don't right. want my children to go through that but understand that christ's church flourishes in bondage so there you go yeah awesome very well said all of that joe um love prevails love that yeah. all right so i do want to get to these two questions yes however i'm going to give you very giving me the briefest of answers for these <laughs> yes sir <laughs> and then and then we will call it a night yes sir all right bear with me here okay so Familiar name here, Enoch Putris, my friend. Woo, Enoch, love the guy. <laughs> former, uh, former um, producer of this show. Yes. The uh, host of the Rundown of Our Reality. Check him out on YouTube and Rumble and wherever else he is. Good show. It's a good show. If if the USA is collapsing and being destroyed from not only the outside, but the inside, how is politics, a Masonic institution going to stop it from happening? Classic Enoch. Classic Enoch. Enoch, I love you, brother. God bless you so much. Um, I would say that the American system of politics in and of itself will not save this country. However, what I would say is back to what we just said, the people of this country will save it. And the only way that the people of this country will save it is if they humble themselves, repent, turn away from their wicked ways and come back to Christ. Amazing. All right. And then Garrett Warfield asked, can spiritual problems be solved with political solutions? If mm. so, how? If not, why not? What's mm -hmm. their interplay? I'm going to say no. And here, and and and, and I want to say, since I took a shorter path <laughs> on the last question, I want to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, but I promise I'll give myself five minutes. Can I have five minutes? Sure. Hey, there are people in the Christian community right now that are saying yes. Okay. They are the Christian nationalists. Now, here's what I'm saying. Christian nationalism is a term that is very nebulous. And honestly, I would say that there is a spectrum of Christian nationalism. On one end of the spectrum of Christian nationalism are people that believe that America was founded as a Christian nation. All right. That at one time was a God-fearing nation. And that if we come back to that, that we will become a God-fearing nation again. I agree with that. On the complete other side of the spectrum are people who are, they tend to be more in the reformed camp. They tend to be more in in um, a in in kind of this this idea that um, we can form a nation, a Christian nation. Um, it's more theocratic in its approach. Okay, and what they will say and what they will argue, and these are these are individuals, and I'm going to call them out by name, and you can edit this out. I give you full permission, um, but I'm going to call them out by name: Dr. Stephen Wolf, Joel Webin. And oh, by the way, if Joe Webin gets a hold of this, I'm more than happy to debate you. I live in Texas. Um, catch me outside. Um, and <laughs> no, let's um, uh, let's say that that's a formal invitation right here on Camp Hormone. Yeah, yeah, more than happy, and I'll and I'll do it on Camp Hormone if he'll if he'll come on because I'll be honest with you, Joe Webin kind of made an, a, a mockery of Christianity with his actions. But he's he I, I do believe that he is a brother. I just believe he is a brother in error. And and I love him as a brother and and I and I hope that God will bring him to light. But here's the thing, and the reason why I bring them up 
is because they tend to be the most vocal voices towards this Christian nationalism that calls for a nationalist state based on Christianity. And they claim that they can solve the world's ills by a cultural Christianity, not necessarily a spiritual revelation, revelation of Christ permeating through the people, but that if they just simply pass laws that force right living, that it will push people towards Christ, and that ultimately it'll bring them to salvation. Okay. Even Jesus says no to that. And if you're interested in a, a wider take on this, please go to uh, the Ecclesia Post, a Christian underground blog, Ecclesia Post, E K K L E S E A Post dot com dot okay, um, dot web uh, WordPress dot com, something like that. Okay, and we, we can post it on the, the links. But I, I've gone into two parts where I'm explaining why this version of Christian nationalism should not only be rejected but is actually unbiblical. And so, Garrett, um, I would say, brother, politics is not going to save us. Okay? There are not laws. You cannot legislate someone into heaven. Okay? You just can't do it. That is a hard issue. If you want the laws in the country to change, you have to change the people first especially in a free society. And what's great about our society right now is that you can go out on the street corner, you can get on a soapbox, and you can bring people to Jesus. You can bring people to Jesus at work. You can bring people to Jesus at school. You can bring cheap people to Jesus and then get in his word. The book of Leviticus isn't just a bunch of do's and don'ts. Believe it or not, the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy the book of Exodus were quoted more by the founding fathers than any political philosopher of their time. To the tune of, and I, I'm going to end on this. Sorry, you got me all excited. I'm all revved up. Um, I, and no, I haven't had any coffee. But here's the thing. <laughs> Nick would be very sad about that, by the way. But no, I haven't had any coffee. All right. And if you don't know our friend Nick. All right. Anyways. But here's the thing. If you go and look at the writings of the framers of the Constitution, what you will find is 33% of their references came from the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus, whereas only 11% of the, or no, excuse me, 17% of their writings uh, quoted Montesquieu and only 11% quoted Locke. The rest aren't even close. Those were the three main sources that influenced the founding of our country. And the number one was the Bible. So if you want to know how to form a society based on biblical values, you've got to spend time in the Old Testament. So there you go. Very good. All right. Last question, because I had one more that came in. You've got you've got 60 seconds for this one, and then we got to call it a night. Got it. I got it. Here we go. All right. From Anita Slioni. Sorry, Anita, if I pronounce your last name incorrectly. Thoughts on that? those... Thoughts on those who are choosing not to vote. Many people have told me they feel like their vote won't matter because it's already planned who will be the next president. 60 mm. seconds. 60 seconds. Vote. Because if you don't vote, you don't have a say. Okay. Your, vo your vote is your voice, no matter what, even if it's planned. And beyond that, get your friends out there to vote, but encourage them in Christ. Encourage them to go out preach the gospel that's the only thing that's going to save our society Boom. love it all right joe i'm looking forward to seeing you at the mysteries of the lbl conference hopefully yes. we can get you out there there yes. still are a few tickets left so if you want to come join us in, in katie's kentucky october 18th through the 20th go to campermon.com snatch up those last few tickets all right, camp on, Joe. Camp on. Until next time, Mike.